seven policy recommendations. Federal legislation, stock exchange rules, and even the recommendations of public commissions, however distinguished, can only do so much to bring about the needed reform. Changes in governance process, while absolutely necessary, are not sufficient to get us where we need to go. We need to change the behavior of people, specifically our corporate managers, our corporate directors, and our corporate owners, who finally must join forces to bring about the needed reform. These seven policy recommendations are designed to help reach that goal. 1. Encourage corporate citizenship. For managers and directors to become more responsive to the needs of owners, the owners of stocks must behave as responsible corporate citizens, thoughtfully voting their proxies and constructively communicating their views to corporate management. The SEC's 2003 requirement that mutual funds disclose to their owners how the funds vote their owners' proxies – proxies, to be clear, that should always be voted in the interests of the owners rather than in the interests of managers – is a long overdue first step in increasing the motivation of financial intermediaries to participate in governance matters. The fund industry was dragged kicking and screaming into providing this disclosure. Indeed, deeply concerned about the industry's opposition to the SEC proposal in December 2002, I wrote an op-ed essay in the New York Times arguing in its favor. Fund managers are the agents. Fund shareholders are the principals. Shareholders are owners of the stocks. To deny them information about how funds voted their proxies would stand on its head the common understanding of the principal agency relationship. By their long forbearance and lassitude on governance issues, funds bear no small share of the responsibility for the failures in corporate governance and accounting oversight that were among the major forces creating the recent market bubble. If the owners of our corporations don't care about governance, who else is there to assume that responsibility? 2. Clearly separate ownership from management. We need to recognize the bright line between directing the responsibility of the governing body of an institution and managing the responsibility of the executives who run the business. It's called separation of powers. It requires that boards be composed largely of truly independent directors who have no history of employment with the company, nor any business relationships, past or present. However difficult spirit is to measure, board members must be independent in spirit, concerned solely with placing the interests of the owners as the overriding priority. Simply put, while the CEO should be boss of the business, an independent chairman should be the boss of the board. In addition, directors should move toward greater reliance on outside advisors and consultants to provide them with independent information that is free of management bias, particularly on compensation and accounting matters, but also on major policy issues as well. This may involve the formation of a small board staff, strictly answerable to the board, that would assemble, distribute, and monitor relevant information. These further reforms in board governance would help to clarify that the role of senior officers is to manage the property of the owners, and the role of directors is to act as their stewards. 3. Fix the stock option mess. To the extent that management holds a substantial and continuing ownership position, obviously management and ownership are more closely aligned for example, as in publicly held companies in which the original families continue to hold a substantial stake. Therefore, we should encourage managers to acquire and hold substantial stock positions. In the language of the economists, we must align the behavior of the agents with the interests of the principals. While building stock ownership by executives is an appropriate objective, it must be done in a way that is fair to the other owners who assumed the risks of ownership when they purchased their shares at the market price. Directors, therefore, should carefully consider the dilution engendered by additional option issuance, as well as the cumulative dilution of previous options. Directors should make these decisions with reference to the particular circumstances of their own company. Everybody else is doing it is hardly a sound reason to award excessive portions of corporate ownership at bargain prices to managers.
and option expenses must at last be expensed. They have never been free, and expensing will help compensation committees to consider the magnitude of the dilution in ownership interest that they entail. While business interests continue to mount a powerful lobbying effort in Congress, in the courts, and even at the SEC to head off the Financial Accounting Standards Board's final approval of a requirement that the cost of fixed-price stock options must be accounted for as a corporate expense, it seems obvious that sound accounting principles demand that such options receive the same tax treatment as other stock-based compensation and taken into account as an expense of the corporation. Directors and owners should not be tricked into, nor should owners ratify, the awarding of options in the traditional form. Even if expensed, fixed-price options remain fundamentally flawed as instruments that reflect the longer-term intrinsic value of the corporation. With the accounting playing field now expected to be leveled off by expensing all forms of options, it is time that we turn to other, better forms that are designed to reward executives for more substantial accomplishments than pushing stock prices momentarily higher. Options whose prices take dividends into account and whose prices are adjusted for the cost of capital. Options that index a company's stock price to the prices of corporate peers and or of the stock market itself. And options that reward executives for building enduring corporate value. Further, options should be issued on a long-term basis so as to further discourage management focus on short-term results with provisions that require executives to hold a certain amount of their stock during their employment by the company, and perhaps even for a specific period thereafter, with clawback provisions for returning profits to the company if earnings are restated. I once asked the CEO if his company had any requirement that the shares he acquired through options should be held for a certain period. He responded, why on earth would anyone want to do that? Of course, substantial stock ownership by executives would help align the interest of managers with those interests of owners, but the shares would be acquired on terms that are fair to owners as well as managers, and holdings that are largely sustained during the executive's tenure and even beyond. Boards that see their duty as placing the interest of the owners ahead of the interest of the managers will carefully consider these issues. 4. Focus pay on performance not peers. Stock options have become the major avenue to the grossly excessive executive compensation of the recent era, but it is only by considering total compensation that we can work toward solutions. The compensation system has been built not on pay for performance, but on pay versus peers, resulting in the year after year ratcheting up of pay. In a truly vicious circle, complacent boards move their lower-ranking CEOs up the ladder, causing other CEOs to move down. In their presentations to compensation committees, compensation consultants have come to rely heavily on a ranking of executives vis-a-vis -vis their peers in terms of their total compensation, salary, short-term incentives, bonus, and long-term incentives, stock but tabulations that focus on the compensation of peers to the exclusion of the corporate performance achieved by peers are at the heart of what went wrong in corporate America. At the very least, consultants should also rank the executives in a given firm in terms of the performance of the firm vis-a-vis -a, -vis a well-defined peer group. In this way, only top performers would receive the top incentive compensation. Average performers would receive average compensation. And if the word incentive is to have any substantive meaning, those who fall below average would receive no incentive pay whatsoever. Of course, the measurement of corporate performance is complex and to some extent arbitrary. But some sensible measurement is better than nothing. It should relate not to evanescent stock prices, but to the creation of corporate value, cash flow, dividend generation, return on total capital compared to peer companies and to American industry in general, and so on. Setting standards and calling on employees to measure up to them is, after all, what CEOs do. 
Indeed, dare I say that the CEO is also an employee of the corporation? Is it asking too much to demand that directors do the same as they measure their CEOs in terms of their peers' accomplishments as well as their peers' compensation? Those measurement standards, more than incidentally, should be made available to stockholders in the corporation's proxy statements. The owners have a right to some assurance that pay for performance is not only the guiding principle, but the operative reality. 5. Return to a long-term focus. Owners and managers must unite in the task of returning the focus of corporate strategy and corporate information alike to long-term financial goals, cash flows, intrinsic values, and progress in the development of strategic direction. Quarterly earnings guidance, pernicious yet still omnipresent, should be eliminated, replaced by quarterly reports that cover not only the operations and financial results for the firm, but a discussion of significant changes to the long-term business plan, unexpected changes in costs, business volumes and market share, status of competitive position, and so on. While all of this information must be publicly disclosed, it is professional analysts and money managers who will most carefully analyze it. Thus, open video meetings of executives with these experts, with publicly available transcripts, should become common. Long-term shareholders who engage in candid communication with management and are cooperative rather than confrontational, describing what they expect from their investment, including what dividends they expect, will play a major role in the restoration of owner's capitalism. Management can help by abandoning best-foot-forward press releases and pro forma earnings reports that ignore the negative events of the period. 6. Let the sunlight shine on accounting. Given the enormous latitude accorded by the generally accepted accounting principles, Owners must demand, and managers must provide, full disclosure of the impact of significant accounting policy decisions. Indeed, perhaps corporations ought to be required to report their earnings both on a most aggressive basis, presumably what they are reporting today, and on a most conservative basis as well. Seriously, why not report a range, along with reasons for the differences, and let investors decide if the differences are meaningful or not. Although such a stark policy may be too much to expect, serious work already has begun to improve the reporting of financial results and increase their relevance. The book, Its Earnings That Count, for example, presents two supplemental income statements that Hewitt Heiserman dubs enterprising, showing the company's return relative to its total capital base, and defensive, showing the extent to which a company depends on outside sources of capital, in addition to the present GAAP statement. Do we really need three earnings reports? For those who recall the sensible rule of the ancient carpenter, measure twice, cut once, measuring thrice is one more way to enhance the ability of shareholders to understand the corporation's financial statements. Another improvement would be requiring corporations to make their federal tax returns available to the public, perhaps summarized in their annual reports. Owners of more than 1% of a corporation's stock already have the right to examine its federal tax returns. It is widely understood that the earnings that corporations report to the Internal Revenue Service are almost invariably lower than the earnings they report to shareholders, and an understanding of the differences is crucial to informed analysis. Interestingly, tax return information is the basis for the aggregated corporate earnings reported by the Department of Commerce, which found that corporations were consistently misreporting on income tax returns. The commerce data are adjusted for this understatement of income, which totaled a stunning $772 billion in 1996 to 2001 alone. Over time, we must develop a set of common principles for reporting earnings and presenting balance sheets. We also must establish a rigorous standard of full financial disclosure that goes beyond simple compliance with accounting rules. 
corporate books and records and corporate tax returns should be opened up to all interested parties, certainly including the millions of shareholders who together own the corporation, either directly or through mutual and pension funds, just as we would if the corporation had a single owner. We also need to strengthen the backbones of our audit firms to stand up to managements that want to push the envelope in order to report the best possible results. Now that we are down to the so-called final four giant accounting firms, the power in the traditionally client-dominated relationship may in fact be slowly shifting from client to auditor. One of the tragedies of recent years was the decision of the Department of Justice to indict the entire Arthur Anderson firm, the fifth auditor, which had radically departed from its rich heritage of principled behavior. A group led by Paul Volcker, of which I was a member, was prepared to step in and provide truly independent directors for the firm and create a gold standard for accounting practice. But at the Justice Department claim, clients fled in droves, and Arthur Anderson and the progressive idea died. Nonetheless, true independence is the direction in which the governance of accounting firms must move, with auditors providing solely audit services and not consulting services to a particular client. In an environment in which the stability of the relationship between auditor and client is vital to the confidence of investors, auditors need but a little gumption, and perhaps the omnipresent threat of shareholder litigation, to stand on principle. 7. A new mindset for the board. Every bit as important as establishing a more effective board structure is establishing a new mindset for corporate directors. Rules-based governance can all too easily lead to a counterproductive checklist mentality. So we must go further by changing the governance climate. The mood of the boardroom must develop into one of true intellectual independence, even at the cost of some collegiality, with a corresponding diminution of groupthink and CEO dominance. We need to recognize, as journalist James Surowiecki has pointed out, that dissent need not mean dissension, and that even when they may disagree, informed and enlightened individuals can reach an intelligent collective decision. He cites the wise and courageous words of Alfred Sloan, who ran General Motors from 1923 to 1956. When the GM board unanimously approved a resolution in favor of one of his proposals, he said, Gentlemen, I take it that we are all in complete agreement on the decision here. Then I propose that we postpone further discussion to give ourselves time to develop disagreement and perhaps gain some understanding of what the decision is all about. In that anecdote lies a marvelous insight into how truly effective corporate governance should work.